If the first four interviews in Anything But Footy's Great British Bosses podcast series has taught me anything, it's that there are various ways of measuring sporting success. Is it one standout superstar, a multiple world and Olympic champion and record holder? Is it strength in depth, having a number of individuals all competing in and around the top level? Or is it having a mass participation programme, working with the sport's grassroots and making inroads with difficult to reach communities? Of course, some sports could claim all of the above, and British gymnastics is one. Multiple Olympic medalist and current world champion Max Whitlock is a standout performer. Joe Fraser, Ellie Downey and Becky Downey are all current world medalists, Joe winning gold. Great Britain has qualified both men's and women's teams for the next Olympics. And the sport continues to thrive in clubs up and down the country with a membership of over 400,000. I'm Michael. And I'm John, and this is Great British Bosses from Anything But Footy, the podcasts that aim to shed a light on sports that don't always have a spotlight on them. Michael and I have a combined 50 years of broadcasting and sports reporting experience behind us, having covered events like the 2012 Olympics, Rio, Glasgow and the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games. And for this episode, we're here at Lillishall, the home of British Gymnastics. And I'm Jane Allen, Chief Executive of British Gymnastics. Jane, it's great to have you on Great British Bosses, and we deliberately delayed the recording of this until your return from Stuttgart and the World Championships, where there was another Super Saturday for British sport, and I'm talking about Max Whitlock and the, the Downey sisters, of course, but how do you look back on the medal return and the, the time out in Germany at the Worlds? Well, obviously, being our Olympic qualification, the World Championships were extremely important to us, and I have to say... We went out there as a nervous group. It's a big time for the sport. Um, We'd like to have thought that we would come back at least qualified for the Olympics in both teams. Um, But gymnastics is an extremely difficult sport and sometimes it throws up things to you that you're not sure um, are on the horizon. But luckily for us, I have to say it was a fabulous world championship for us. The best result ever for a British gymnastics team at a world championship, two gold medals, a silver medal and a bronze medal, uh, and both teams qualified for the Olympics. So as you said, we had a bit of fun with having our own Super Saturday, Uh, went into the apparatus finals uh, on the Saturday, Max Whitlock, triple world champion. I mean, what a hero he is and a fabulous champion for the sport. Um, And the two Downey sisters, the double Downies, as they call themselves, came through with medals on both uneven bars and vault. Come to Max in a moment, because, you know, we could speak for half an hour about him and his achievements. But let's talk about Becky and Ellie, first of all. You know, both of them have had their their troubles, their traumas over the the past few months. What does it mean to you as an organisation and to them as individuals then to to be on that podium? Well, for us, it's um, certainly... Uh, it, it's very important for British gymnastics because it it shows the the quality and depth of the women's program. Obviously, with Max leading the way with the men's program, and before him, Lewis doing his his work at Beijing and then at, at 2012 and Rio. Um, the women's program. It's nice to see them up amongst the medals. Um, uh, Ellie Downey was a superstar as a very very young athlete and has always been on the radar that she will do something special. She, um, I'm really looking forward to Tokyo to see what Ali will do in the vault and also in the all-round. Becky Downey's another story. What a trooper has been around for a long time, 2012 Olympics, um, 2008 Olympics. Always had a, a very difficult road, um, had some serious injuries to overcome. And the, there wasn't a dry eye in the team seeing her finally come through, first of all, qualify for the final and then um, grab that elusive medal that she's been chasing for so long. And I think both John and I would say when we've we've covered major gymnastics events at Olympics and Commonwealth Games, there is a massive team camaraderie, and not just with the gymnasts themselves, the, su- the support staff, the coaches. I don't think I've ever interviewed Max Whitlock, for example, when he doesn't talk about Scott, his coach. He always mm. wants to say it's, it's Scott and I, Scott and I have done this. That's Max's big thing. Now, we were with Max last week and it was interesting because he was saying that, you know, last year where he wasn't a world champion, it's because he was trying new things and he was experimenting a little bit, but now he's got his routines down and now it's just about consolidation. Is that is that something that as an organisation is, is part of the plan, if you like? Yes, well, 
you know, from a from a, a team point of view and from the personal coach's point of view, they map out the program for the gymnasts. Someone like Max has been well, he made his debut at the Olympics in two thousand and twelve. Um, he he would need to be handled very um very specially because he's now married, he has a child. Um, so his program has to be mapped out for him to suit his lifestyle and 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 his body because he's obviously working his way through into mid uh, mid twenties and he has to be sure and of managing injuries and those sorts of things. And I think um, I think Max Whitlock will be around for a long long time. He's he and Scott are a fabulous team, and it's something special in gymnastics the relationship between a gymnast and and their personal coach. Um, that's right through the whole sport. Some of the, the female gymnasts have had their coaches since they've been um, six or seven, so you can imagine the relationship that they have. Um, it's it's they spend a lot of time in the gym together. They have to know each other and trust each other. And so normally, um, what you've seen in Max and Scott is is normally the norm in all the other gymnasts. And before we move on from the world championships, a word on on Joe Fraser again, uh, a surprise gold medal. But actually, it shows the strength and depth of British gymnastics. Absolutely. Let's not forget, we had Super Saturday, but then we had Surprise Sunday, really, <laughs> uh, because we we went into Sunday. Um, I have to say, we did, did not affecting the gymnasts that were competing on a Sunday, of course, but we did do a little bit of celebrating on the <laughs> Saturday night. Um, and then we we're back in the gym on Sunday, and Joe very, very talented um, gymnast, has been for a long time. But what you are seeing is the the road that it's already been mapped out, first of all by Lewis Smith in 2008, and then that fabulous men's team and Max and Lewis and their individual performances in the men's program, the great efforts at Rio. What you're seeing is the next generation that has been totally motivated by those performances. And and Joe is has been um, and is one of our, the best talents that we have coming through. Very young, um, and for him to capture a world champion, um, to be a world champion at his age is fantastic for him. But you know that's the start of his journey. So you know we're hoping for good things to come. But I must say there's plenty more where Joe's come from. So if anyone from the other countries who? is listening, <laughs> tell, tell us who. <laughs> oh, there's a very very talented young lad down south called Diani. Um, Regini Moran and he is a fabulous talent um, unfortunately for him at a younger age um, copped a couple of injuries at the wrong time but he's battled right back and he, he performed so well at Stuttgart a lot of people didn't realise that was his first senior world championship and so um, I have a special thought that he will do something special in the, few, in the next few Olympics You've mentioned Lewis Smith a couple of times how important was him and Beth Tweddle for changing the way that British gymnastics is looked at from the public but also from you know leading the way as you've already said to inspire the next generation I, I, I don't think anybody um, who's involved in sport um, wouldn't know how you know they know how important it is that people that break the glass ceiling you know that it, it's about the perceptions on the world stage it's a judge sport so therefore, um, you know, it's important um, that the judges understand that we have a high quality program and that regardless of who's in the leotard is going to be a quality gymnast. So that's a big start in a judge sport. But uh, Lewis, first of all, in 2008, and Beth was so close in 2008, I, I, I think she was from memory fourth in the uneven bars. And both of those have been fabulous role models. Um, and and I think then 2012 was just so special for the sport. It was really the coming of age of the high performance programs, both men and women. And Beth got her deserved medal. Lewis continued on his journey. And um, and I think the athletes underneath just looked at these athletes and said, we can do it. You know, the younger athletes start to believe that medals are uh, British athletes um, are capable of winning medals. Because you uh, came to British Gymnastics in 2010, so you were here for that glorious summer, as you mentioned, in 2012. When we spoke to Adrian Christie from Badminton, he said that he felt, as a sport, they lost the opportunity of London 2012. I think gymnastics probably grasped it and have run with it ever since. Absolutely. Well, you know, it would have been hard not to, to be honest. Um, but uh, we were... 
you know, we were absolutely delighted. A home Olympic Games and to turn in that performance. And, um, you know, we had packed out crowds at the O2. Um, we had a team, first of all, to, to medal, which was always special. Team gymnastics is very special at the Olympics. Um, the pride of the country really comes through. And so that was fantastic. Um, and I, th I, I just think that the clubs and the athletes and participants around the UK just fell in love with the sport. And I have to say, since 2012, um, we have medalled it obviously at Rio. We, we had a fabulous Rio. But since 2012, our club memberships have, have risen every year. Um, and we've had uh, positive growth every year since 2011. We actually captured a little bit of the roll in to 2012. Um, so we've had growth every year. And um, the sport, any major events we've put on, we've staged European championships, world championships in the UK. Our British championships are all attended with big crowds. You know, I, I think that you're quite right. That was the catalyst. But um, I think we've got a fair share of the UK public that's fallen in love with gymnastics and I hope they stay in love with gymnastics. And you talk about membership there. You've got a young Matthew Cushing and a young Amelie Waydock who's both on your, your books, both yeah. members, both regularly going to gymnastics. I hope you've paid your membership. Of course, we are, we are members. fully paid up members. I'm, I'm not over. <laughs> I'm off to the World Cup in Birmingham in oh, March absolutely. with the family. Yeah. Well, I've got, I've got real fans in front of me, haven't I? <laughs> but I want to ask you, you use the phrase glass ceiling about Lewis Smith. Did you then, uh, as an organisation, encourage Lewis to go off and do other things like Saturday Night TV because it helped the profile of the sport? Or did you think... You know, we've got a potential Olympic gold medalist here. If we can just keep him in the gym a bit more, he might go on and achieve those sort of medals. But where, where's the balance there? Well, first of all, anyone who knows Lewis, it would be hard to keep him anywhere. Uh, he's, a, he's a unique character. Um, I have to say, that, you know, that the profile that we did get, not only from Lewis doing Strictly, and then, of course, we had Beth doing um, her Dancing on Ice as well. Um, I think we received, and I think Claudia Fragapani also in, um, after Rio did some work. I, th I think we were very grateful to the BBC to some regard there. They did help with getting some of our stars in, which I think they do a fabulous job in helping promote sport. So, uh, you know, that's w we were very grateful for that because it, what it did is it took them out of the leotard, gave them a personality, made people understand that, um, you know, sometimes the sport of gymnastics does show a very um, um, concentrated style. You know, the sort of the, the personality from the gymnast isn't isn't able to come through when you're concentrating and doing the difficulty that you do. And these types of shows really allowed us to um, capitalise on these fabulous athletes and their personalities. And I think people, the fans, just loved it. They lapped it up. So you've got someone like Will Bailey, the para table tennis player, obviously he's mm. seemingly picked up quite a serious injury doing mm. Strictly Come Dancing 10 months out from the Paralympics. Yeah. If you were running para table tennis, would you be thinking, I wish he'd been in the sports hall and not on the ballroom mm. floor there? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I'll leave that to para. <laughs> <laughs> para ta was it, um, para table tennis, pa yeah. Sorry, para table tennis to sort. But, but were you watching Lewis every night going, oh, don't no, twist your ankle, well, please don't hurt yourself? I think um, when he was involved, he w it was probably at the right timing for us um, because, to be fair, um, gymnastics is a sport where you sort of prepare leading into major competitions and you usually don't go off getting yourself involved in other things because your timetable doesn't allow. So I think we're a little lucky in that regard that these happened after. But um, yes, it's a tough one, getting that balance of allowing the athlete to, to capitalise on their success as well as hoping they keep their mind on the job. You said earlier that um, gymnastics and, and team gymnastics was particularly special uh, in the Olympics. I think growing up, I'm a huge Olympics fan. First week was swimming second week was athletics and now because I've covered more Olympics I've kind of you, you you do see more of these sports coming through and obviously with cycling you 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 know that that is the first week and gymnastics being in Rio and watching the gymnastics was an it was a special moment because of of London 2012 and now I noticed that your twang is is not quite as British as maybe <laughs> ours is is there in the world is gymnastics as tough a competition as it is for athletics you know I mean anyone can win a medal in athletics 
gymnastics growing up was always seen probably as you know more the eastern europeans were mm-hmm. were, were but has that changed and it's actually a, a lot harder to win medals absolutely um first of all nothing could probably be as tough as athletics because of the number of countries that participate um we have over 120 countries registered with the, the international body but i i have to say i've been in gymnastics for over 30 years and um and it, it has really, really grown up from only being an Eastern, Eastern European um, dominated country, um, sport, sorry. Um, and I think that uh, Asian wise, Koreans, Japan, Chinese, and, and um, in, in the um, American countries, the, the, the South American countries, all of those um, areas have developed their sport. And what's come through is a lot of specialists on apparatus, which um, if, they, if they can't or have, don't have the funding to be able to support the, the team programs, which are quite expensive to do, um, they've really worked hard at supporting talented athletes on different apparatus. And so um, there's a lovely mix coming through now where there's a spread of countries getting medals. Do you miss Australia? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I, I have to tell you that this 10 years of my life, I, I came over here in April 2010 um, to one of the biggest challenges. I was excited when I came over. I had no idea what I was coming to other than I was moving from gymnastics in Australia to gymnastics in England. So obviously I was coming with a skill set that I was hoping would be um, supportive of the role that I was taking. But it's been fabulous. The, the organisation here, British Gymnastics, is a, a wonderful organisation. It's very strong. Um, it, it offers a lot for its members. And I believe it's done a lot to um, ensure that any participant out there that has any talent that wishes to aspire to be anything, doesn't matter whether you reach the Olympics or not, it gives you your opportunity to be either a club champion, a regional champion or one day an Olympic champion. So I'm, you know, I've had a ball, um, you know, obviously at some stage um, I will go home because Australia is my home. And when I do, I'll be very sad because it's been a fabulous journey for me. Um, not sure when that time is, but at the moment, um, the sport's doing well, and I hope that Tokyo produces the same sort of results we've had so far from London and Rio. And before London 2012, it seemed like if we wanted to learn about sport, we needed to bring in the Australians. And obviously, you know, you've played a huge part in changing the way British sport has moved forward. Do you think now that people around the world look at British sport and go, actually, that's where there's a huge expertise? I think um, just British sport in general is so respected worldwide. The systems that you that that we have here, uh, the the government support has allowed for a truly high performance system to be developed. And you know the most important thing in an organisation, particularly um, within British gymnastics, I'm using as an example. Not only do we hope for the one-off champions that come like a Max Whitlock that come along. Um, our job is to put together a, 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 a system that allows for years to come uh, the sport to, to remain at the top level and, and be able to support anybody. Um, and, and the support that sport gets in this country is unbelievable. Um, I came from a sport-mad country, obviously, uh, but the level of support that's here, the system that was developed leading into 2012 and since then has been strengthened, that system through participation support in Sport England and high performance support with uh, UK Sport, the massive support they give to major events in this country, all of those elements um, come together and just produce a dynamic sports country. We're in, let's say, uncertain political times at the moment, but based on what you were just saying there, you look at the way Australia built up for the Sydney Games in 2000, the success they had there, but then you would look at the medal tables and argue that Australia's kind of gone a little bit backwards mm-hmm. as far as, you know, Olympic sport, Paralympic sport is concerned. Great Britain, Northern Ireland had 2012, did fantastically well, pushed on for Rio, which was unheard of. How important then is it that in these difficult political times where we don't really know what's around the corner, that government continues to back top level sport so that Great Britain doesn't go slide back, in, back down the medal table in the way that countries like Australia have? I think it's always a balance with government, isn't it? But I can, I can honestly say 
I don't think there's a country in the world that doesn't recognise what sport does for for its population and its communities. So, and I think in this country it's recognised very strongly. And to be honest with what um, is happening at the moment and the divisiveness that's, that perhaps is uh, within um, at the country at the moment, I think sport's in a really good position because I think sport will unite. It will bring people together. I don't think it's a, a coincidence that the um, 2022 Com Games were backed by government and, and brought to Birmingham. I think, you know, if there had been anybody strategically looking forward, why wouldn't you have something that would have the same impact as London had when you've just made one of the biggest political decisions of your of your life in exiting Europe? I, I think sport is so uniting and I'm so proud of what sport does um, for communities that if government stops funding sport, I think, you know, that would be a very brave government that did that. So let me ask you a question without any breaking any confidences or anything, but... With all that you talk about there with exiting of the EU and everything, are conversations still going on? Are governments still talking to bodies like yours and, you know, ensuring that funding and, and governance and all the other things are happening at the moment? Or is everything just about Brexit right now? Oh, I think, to be fair, mostly it's about Brexit. But I have to say um, all of the support mechanisms around us have been preparing us for any form of impact Brexit will have. And that's, I, I think, has happened in all sorts of industries, not just sport. So we, we've certainly had support mechanisms on that. But I think until it's all settled, um, you know, none of us really know the way forward. Um, for, our, for us, we're just hoping that government will look upon sport as, as, as a, um, a, a pastime that needs to be funded and it needs to be supported so that it can continue to do the good job it's doing. Looking at your other remit, which is participation, and you've mentioned how incredibly well that's going, and you've announced a huge investment in facilities quite recently, I think about £7.5 million, pounds, is that right? Yes, well, we're, um, we've been working very hard on a strategy that's, that's going to be going over an eight-year period and looking at what the barriers are in our sport. And one of the barriers... There's a couple, really, of course, always with other sports, it's the same, the number of coaches that you have. So we're working very strongly on, on modernising our coach education system, making sure how people are educated reflect how um, the people of today at universities and high schools are educated so that we stay modern and relevant in that area. But the most important thing is one of the biggest barriers is spaces. And our clubs are, are full, their waiting lists are there, We've had um, very uh, professional insight done that over a million um, children are on waiting lists across the UK. Now, wow. that's quite frightening. Yeah, and my daughter was. Yes, that's exactly right. So we, we, we um, commissioned that research and we were really quite staggered. So for us in our, one of our main priorities in our STRAT plan is that, um, that we look at how we encourage facility development. Now, that can be the new facilities or assisting clubs to expand their facilities and um, and so we've we've um, worked together with a social investor um, we haven't yet publicly launched it because um, at the moment we're just going through some steps to to ensure that some of the pilots we're doing are, are, are working but this 7.5 million that um, the social investor plus sport England plus ourselves and we've committed our own our own money, two million of our own members' money into this project. We're hoping the seven point point five million will provide um, cheap um, loans for clubs, um, so that you know our club owners don't have to mortgage or second mortgage their homes or, or or really go into debt for the love of the sport that they do and their small businesses that they have. So we're hoping that we can be there and be right beside them when they're thinking about expanding their business. I mean, the numbers you've talked about are so impressive. 100,000 new members since 2012, a million on the waiting list. So what I discovered when I became a parent two or three years ago, and, you know, my son, as Michael said, is a, is a member of British Gymnastics now, and he's three, um, is that you could... They opened up the gym in the morning, 9.30 in the morning, for an hour, and it's basically soft play. And so you, so it feels like... But it, it brings them into a, an atmosphere and a, and a kind of uh, location where... They can see what you know what fun sport can be, and I just thought 
that's such a clever idea. And I'd never known it had happened until I, until I had my son. Mm. Well, I think the, the clubs themselves, you know, they're the hub of the community. If you go across the UK, um, the clubs, the gymnastic clubs in most of the towns and, and smaller cities or even the larger cities, there'd be multiple clubs, but they're the hubs of the community. And therefore, um, opening their club up and having all ranges of sizes, um, you know, all, the equality message that that sends. It's open to anybody that, that wants to come into the club. It's very welcoming. Our job is to assist the club to be safe environment. That's important for us, that it's a safe, friendly and fun environment. And um, we're also, what's important for us is that the um, sport is a foundation sport. So the sooner we can get young children into the gym and learning how to handle their bodies and not be afraid of falling or jumping, um, all of those things go to creating a healthy um, uh, opportunity for the, for the child to develop, either stay in gymnastics or to develop into other sports. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're quite proud of the fact that we're seen as one of the foundation sports. Obviously, swimming and athletics provide the same good foundation, but we're, we're very proud of that. Can gymnastics grow in this country? Absolutely. Um, if, we can, if we can manage the um, facility message, if we can get um, some more fil facility investment, it's actually quite a good business. You know, it's, it's a small business. If you can encourage more people to go into the business of gymnastics and providing that facilities, then I think we'll have more young children in the sport. The more sp children you have at the base level, the more champions that you might be able to to have coming out at the top end. There, there might be more Beth Tweddles and, and, and Becky Downies around and Max Whitlocks. Um, that's not our sole aim, but, you know, I, I'm a great believer that it's the entire picture that makes the sport strong. You can't focus only on the top end. And if you only focus on the bottom end, what do the kids have to look up to? Where are their role models and where is their... their their desire to strive and to be the best they can and um, you need your children to be able to understand you should work hard to be the best you can and you might not be an Olympic champion but you're a champion within yourself if you do the best you can. So for me I think it's important that um, that, that we recognise the value of a, 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 a aligned sport that concentrates not only at the base end but allows for the pathways to be developed and for champions to emerge. Is it therefore a strength of your organisation, if you like, that you've got this elite end, which offers terrific value for money when you look at the medal return in Rio, which is pretty much a, you, for every two athletes you sent, mm -hmm. one brought a medal home, but you've also got the grassroots participation end because it's not the same in swimming and athletics. British swimming, British athletics are looking after their elite athletes and then you're relying on England athletics and swim mm. Scotland to deal with the grassroots, the participation, and then trying to get the pathways between them. So is it a strength then of British gymnastics that you can take three-year-old Matthew Cushing and in wherever, Dubai 2046, <laughs> make him <laughs> an Olympic champion? No pressure. <laughs> well, I, I'm a bit biased because I am the CEO of British gymnastics, so I'll leave the other sports to concentrate on themselves. But I can tell you that the, the business model, as I would call it, for British gymnastics is extremely strong because um, when I say the business model, it has the ability to go right from cradle to grave, basically. It's, it's a sport that, you know, it's an organisation that can reach out and has control over the areas that they can align. And we have a very strong relationship with the home countries as well. And we have working partnership agreements with those countries, those um, uh, home countries. And by joining up all of those things and having a combined vision for the sport, um, it just makes uh, gymnastics strong as a business, as I say. And whilst I should be calling it a sport, it is. But if you want the sport to be strong and move forward and be sustainable, it needs to adopt a very strong base um, business approach so that it can say it can stay financially sustainable for the future so just before we reach the end of this i said seven medals in rio oh god <laughs> it, you know what's coming next can, yeah, can you do the same in tokyo uh, we, it's not all about medals i yeah. think we've established that yeah. not just in this episode yeah. of great british bosses but in all the episodes it's not just about medals but 
in terms of the headlines and getting mm. people on Strictly Come Dancing, can you can you get seven or more? Um, well, you never say never, but I do remember if I could just recount the night that uh, we got our seventh medal in Rio. Um, you know, we were we were thinking that maybe we'd gone to another dimension in a planet. Where, where were we? What what was happening to us as our athletes were just delivering? Um, we said to ourselves, you know, then how will we ever be able to eclipse this? You know, and that's always a hard question because um, our athletes have got the talent. Um, we had our best ever world championship in Stuttgart. Uh, the rest of the world continues to develop. Um, really, when you get to the Olympic Games, a lot of factors have to align. Um, we always say the moons have to align. And uh, if the moons align for us, anything can happen. I would hope that we could come back with at least two or three um, as our base. And anything after that, I think, would be fabulous. Finally, for me, when you're back in Australia, and we don't want that to be any time soon, um, and you're sipping a glass of wine, <laughs> what are you looking back on as your biggest success? The, biz oh, the bi biggest success, um, for me, looking back on British gymnastics, I think you sort of captured it early on, is that the ability for us to have broken through um, at the London Olympics, utilised a home games, which is so important. You, you know, we did fabulously at Rio, but you know, doing it at your home games, you get a much bigger impact from, from this, for the sport. I think capitalising on that and taking that journey from 2012 right through to Rio and now into Tokyo and being able to maintain the momentum at club level, um, building the organisation up. Um, uh, in 2010, it had 70 um, staff that were trying to service an enormous um, membership. We now have quite a, a well-resourced organisation. Um, we have growth over 400,000 members 1200 clubs and I think the biggest success for me is just capitalizing on on that and being able to align everything else with it so that the sport can 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 really you know grow and have the momentum to go forward so I think the biggest success story for British gymnastics is just the way it's been able to move itself forward on the successes it's had and 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 not look back and say we missed the beat, you know. If we could just do that again, maybe we could have done it better. I think we've got a very talented staff here and our clubs are just the absolute salt of the earth for us and, and I think they've done a fab job. And I, I'm very proud and I look back, the next generation will take this forward and, and I'll look back with pride that I at least was played some part in it. Well, Jane Allen, Chief Executive of British Gymnastics, thank you very much for talking to great British bosses from anything but footy. Yeah, thank you very much.